Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to a new ethics class. And we have been discussing normative ethical theories uh, until now. We have gone to uh, utilitarian theory, challenges against utilitarian theory, and we have seen one applied issue uh, where we can use the utilitarian theory to have uh, moral uh, verdicts. And then we switched our uh, attention to Kantian deontology, and we talked about how this ethical theory uh, works. And today we are going to talk about challenges for Kantian deontology. So let me first remind you the formulations of the categorical imperative. And categorical imperative, as you might remember, is the moral rule that Kant refers to as the as the one of the foundational uh, aspects of his uh, moral theory, of his ethical theory. And here is the categorical imperative, which we will we'll also call from now on the formula, formula of universal law. And it says this, act only on that maxim through which that you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. So let me read it again, act only on that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. So for us, it might be a little bit odd worded, uh, uh, sentence, but we have gone through some of the terminology here. We, we talked about what maxim means. It's more or less, uh, it more or less means a principle for, for Kant. So you should act on a, on a certain principle and through, through that principle, you should at the same time uh, will, and will is, a, I, I, as I said in the, in the previous class, is a particular word, is a terminology that Kant uses. But for our purposes, let's assume that it's, it just means want for the time being. You can at the same time want that it should become a, a law that's universal for everybody and, and for all times. So you should act on a, on a, on a certain principle that you, you can want that everybody else at all times can act on that principle as a, as a moral law, as, a, as if it, it was a law that you cannot break. So that was the idea of a moral rule which Kant named categorical imperative. And this, this formulation is also called the formula of universal law. And according to Kant, this is the only categorical imperative. But other moral rules, rules should also have the categorical form with or, uh, without an ex explicit or implicit conditional clause to, in order to have moral worth. So having categorical form means it should be something like an imperative. It should command a certain thing. And it shouldn't be like a hypothetical form in the sense that it shouldn't have if clause. If you want to become rich, you should uh, respect your customers. You should not treat your customers uh, in, in a deceptive way, for instance. This would be a hypothetical sentence. But treat, treat your customers in a respectable way or do not deceive your customers. These two sentences are, are, have the categorical form. They are in the imperative form. They do not have any, any if clause within them. So only such clauses, only such uh, rules, moral rules have moral worth only if they pass the categorical test, categorical imperative test according to Kant. And these are the things, some of the things that we discussed in our previous class. Let's go on with Kant's other two formulations of the categorical imperative. So until now, we have discovered only one formulation of categorical imperative in which Kant talks about universalization of certain maxims. If your maxim can become a universal law, if you can want that, if you can will that your maxim be can become a universal law, and if you act on such a maxim, then your, your act can uh, pass the categorical imperative test. That was the first formulation of a categorical imperative that we have learned until now. So from this point on, we will discuss about two more formulations that Kant introduces to us as, as uh, having an equivalent value for the first formulation of categorical imperative. And he names these two other formulations, the formula of, of the kingdom of ends and the formula of humanity. So let's, let's look at the first formula of Kingdom of Ends and see what Kant, how Kant formulates that formula. So the first formula, the formula of Kingdom of Ends says, act in accordance with the maxims of a member, member giving universal laws for a merely possible Kingdom of Ends. Again, not a not very familiar wording for us, but I'll, I'll just uh, expand what it means in the coming slides. Let me, let me just look at the other formulation for the time being. The formula of humanity says, so act that you, you use humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, always at the same time as an end and never merely as a means. So this, this is even uh, 
weirder than the first uh, formula. We, we are in this formula so act that you use humanity, we are using humanity in a sense, and we should treat uh, humanity, whether in our own person or in the person of any other, always at the same time as an end, never merely as a means. So this, this old wording should become clear in the coming slides. Let me first talk about the formula of the kingdom of ends. Again, this, this formula says, act in accor accordance with the maxims, principles of a member, uh, giving universal laws for a merely possible kingdom of ends. So we're talking about the kingdom here. Of course, it's, it's kind of a metaphorical language. We're talking about, about a kingdom of ends. So what, what, does, what does Kant mean by people being ends? They, they, have, they are not merely means to certain goals, to certain aims. They are actually goals themselves. People have intrinsic moral value. That's what ends, the word end refers to here. People, human beings have intrinsic moral value or rather in, in Kant's uh, framework, rational beings, not only human beings, but all rational beings because Kant includes angels and possible extraterrestrial beings into this categorization. All these rational beings are ends in themselves. They, they have intrinsic moral value. So for Kant, each of us is one person among others. We are, we are a maxim, we, sorry, we are a member giving maxim uh, uh, which, which is a candidate for became, becoming a universal law. So the, the maxims that we are giving, the, the principles that we are suggesting to our group are, are candidates for becoming universal laws in, in a group of people or in a group of rational beings in which everybody has intrinsic moral worth. Nobody is, is a means to another goal. Nobody can, nobody can be used as, as if they are a tool, but they have intrinsic moral goals. So each of us is one person among others. This is one of the ideas in this uh, formulation of the categorical imperative. And for moral rules, from the point of view of moral rules, each of us is both ruler and ruled. So we are, we are, uh, giving, we are giving universal laws. In that sense, we are ruler in a kingdom. We make the rules, but we are also ruled by these rules. No one is in a special position from the moral point of view. Even if you are give, giving the rules, if you, even if you are king of this moral kingdom, you, are not, uh, uh, you cannot create exception for yourself. You're bound by these rules as well. Each of us uh, makes moral rules, but each of us is also bound by them. And this, this is the idea. These are the ideas uh, that are incorporated in this formulation of uh, categorical imperative. It's more or less clear, I think. The second formulation, which is more famous than the, uh, the, the, the one that I just talked about, is the formula of humanity. It says, so act that you use humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, always at the same time as an end, never, never merely as a means. So treating someone, either another person or yourself, as, a, as an end and never as a mere means. So let's, let's see what, what this idea incorporates. The main idea is this. Never treat people as a mere means, always treat them also as ends, also as intrinsically valuable beings. So that's what end means in this context. And think of examples where you treat someone as a mere means, as a mere tool to, to your purposes. Cases would include exploitation, cases of exploitation, and cases of manipulation. When you manipulate someone for your own goal, for your own aim, you're treating that person as a mere tool, as if they, they don't have their own plans, but they are just tools to, for you to reach your own uh, uh, goals. That's how you treat those people. When you manip manipulate them or when you exploit them. So this is clearly a moral wrong, right? Even, even if, uh, even if we, we, we do not try to apply the categorical imperative that Kant suggests us, even intuitively it's wrong. And Kant just actually catches, captures this intuition and formulates it in, in, in the formula of humanity uh, formulation of, of the categorical imperative. So you're not supposed to treat anyone as a mere means. Let's see some examples. So example, for example, do I treat the cashier as a mere means in a supermarket? So if, if I do it, if I treat the cashier as a mere means, then I would be some, doing something wrong according to the uh, humanity formulation of categorical imperative. To compare it with the way you treat a vending machine in bad conditions, look at this vending machine. The, the window is broken. I mean, it, 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 the vending machine is actually broken into. People are probably stealing things from it. So, and when, when you come to this vending machine, should you just uh, like respect the vending machine and uh, like put your coin and take take your good? Or I mean, you you might choose to put your coin and take your good because you might think that otherwise it's a theft. That's that's another issue. But are you 
when you are not stealing from this vending machine, are you disrespecting the vending machine, or, or the, are you disrespecting the the uh, person who is running this business, either the business of having the vending machine or the business of producing those goods? Which one are you disrespecting? Dis you are probably disrespecting the person, not the machine itself. Or sometimes you you see people, maybe some somebody broke this window not for the purpose of stealing something, but maybe they were just very angry because the vending machine didn't work properly. Maybe they just put the coin, they, they just entered the right numbers, but the vending machine didn't work. So they just so crazy that they broke the window with, with a tool. They just, they just attacked the vending machine uh, with a vengeful mood. So this is clearly wrong, but it's not a wrong towards the vending machine. It's not a disrespectful, disrespectful behavior towards the machine. It might be disrespectful towards the person who owns this machine, right? And compare it with the way you treat a cashier in, in a supermarket or in the store that you're, you're visiting. You're expected to treat, uh, expected to respect the person that the cashier is. You're not supposed to ignore their working conditions. You're treating the cashier as a means, but not merely as a means. So you're treating the cashier as a means because you want, you want the cashier to just check your items and take your credit card or your cash, maybe give, give, you, give you change and, or give you your credit card back. So you're treating them as a, as a tool for your end but not merely as a tool. You also respect the uh, person that, that the cashier is. You're, you're treating, treating that person as a respectable human being. So for instance, like, like in the vending machine example, if the cashier were, were to get stuck at some point, you're not supposed to like curse at the person or, or, or hit the person or anything like that. You're, you're supposed to treat them as also a respectable human being at the same time. So treating someone as a mere means uh, incorporates the idea that you can treat them as a means it, only if at the same time you're always treating them also as a respectable human being in this example, for instance, okay? Another example is sweatshops. You might not know this word, but sweatshops are, are factories like, like the one in the picture. So it's a messy workshop. There, there are sometimes child workers in sweatshops and uh, they're, everybody's working overtime. They don't, it's not well ventilated. It's, it's not, there's not, I mean, the working conditions are not, it's far from ideal. It's very bad working conditions. They're not paid enough. They are really uh, bad, bad working conditions. Sweatshops are places that you don't, you don't want to work in. Many workers, some of them being children, work under horrendous, unacceptable conditions. And most of our clothes today are produced under such conditions. So we are using these people as a means to, to, to attain our goal of uh, getting our garments or, or shoes or toys. We are using them as a means. We are just benefiting from their labor. But they also ignoring the conditions of these workers would be treating them as mere means to our own, end, to our own ends. If you are uh, not uh, paying attention to the working conditions that these people are working in, for instance, if you are not taking part in, in a boycott that, that's, uh, that's a promising boycott when, when they're uh, protesting these sort of uh, working conditions, if you're not taking it seriously, then you're not only using these people as a means, which is acceptable sometimes, but you're also using them as a mere means, which is not acceptable according to Kantian categorical imperative. So using someone as a mere means incorporates the idea that you are ignoring the conditions that they are working in. So this would be another example of how you, you might use someone as a, as a mere means. Kant also says that you should not treat yourself as a mere means. Part of the formula of humanity prohibits you to treat yourself as a mere means. And let me remind you the, the formula here. So act that you use humanity, whether in your own person, so this part is, is, is about treating yourself as a mere means, whether in your own person, so act that you use humanity, whether in your own person, or in the person of any other, always at the same time as an end, never merely as a means. So you're not supposed to treat your own person, treat humanity in your own person, never merely as a means. But treating, using humanity in, in a person is, is already a kind of awkward idea for us. How do I treat, how do I use humanity when I, when I uh, treat someone in a certain way? But Kant has the idea that you have to rem remember that that person is not only made of uh, uh, meat and bones. That person, either your, be it yourself or someone, someone else, that person is, is, is part of humanity. It that person carries with it the values that we attribute to humanity of, of being a rational being. 
right? So in, in that sense, you use humanity when you treat someone uh, either as an end or, or, or as, a, as a means. So in this aspect of uh, the, the second formulation of categorical, categorical imperative, you're focusing on uh, how you should treat yourself according to Kant. So Kant, Kant thinks that you ought to refrain from behavior degrading to yourself. You should not uh, degrade your own humanity. You should, be, you should also be treating yourself as a respectable human being that you are. You should treat yourself as the rational, respect being, being, respectable being that you are. That's, that's the idea here. Let's see some examples and try to understand what Kant might mean by treating ourselves as ends, but never merely as a means. So we know that unfortunately, some people try to survive poverty uh, by selling their own kidneys. Some people actually are so poor that they, they, they agree to, to sell their own kidneys to someone who needs a kidney and who, who can afford buying a kidney. So for Kant, people, who, so Kant doesn't give this example. This is, let, let me make it clear. This is not Kant's own example. This is an example that we, I'm, I'm uh, trying to make sense of using, by means of using Kant's uh, theory, because we will come to Kant's own examples later on. So that, let me make this clear that this selling kidneys is not Kant's own example. Probably in Kant's time, uh, in, in the place that he lived, uh, in, in 18th century, 19th century, there were no possibility of kidney transplants. I'm not, I would be very much surprised to see that. So, but if we, we can still apply these ideas to, to today's uh, ethical problems. That's why I picked this example to show how we can use a theory that comes from a couple of centuries ago and be applied to one of today's pressing topics. So Kant would probably, or a Kantian would probably say that people who are selling their kidneys are doing something morally wrong because they're, they're treating their bodies uh, or their cell, their, their themselves as a mere means to, to, uh, to another goal. Their goal is to, to get rid of the intolerable tolerable conditions of poverty. They are, they are suffering poverty. Probably they, they might have also kids that, that are suffering with them. So they need urgent financial uh, uh, assistance, right? And, and they, the, the way they find is selling their own kidneys. So although it's, uh, it's really tragic, this, these conditions are really tragic, and we do not want to accuse these people of anything. I mean, you do not want to accuse the person who is already suffering poverty, and you do not want to put a further blame on them saying that, oh, you're doing something morally wrong because you're selling your kidney. That's not the point here. But nevertheless, Kant says it's more, it's still, we should remember that it's still morally wrong, right? So the person might be doing something necessary. They, they might just be, be urged to do this, but Kant says, okay, they, it's, it's so horrible that they have to do this. Uh, Kant, it's, not, uh, it's not Kant says, but Kant might say, or a Kantian might say that it's, it's, it might be horrible that these people have to sell their kidneys. Nevertheless, it's, it's still morally wrong. Moreover, people who are buying these kidneys and others who are in a position to prevent it, like the government officials and who do not prevent it, are certainly committing moral wrongs as well, because it's not the on, on, on the person who is selling their own kidney or who is treating someone as a mere means, but people who, who, is, who are buying a kidney is treating someone as a mere means to their own goal. They're, they're buying these kidneys, and I'm not talking about here a, a, a kidney donation or, or a or a situation in which a person is uh, selling a kidney because they're like fully healthy and, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a consensual agreement. In this example, the person is selling the kidney out of extreme poverty. So they, they, they just have no other means to get rid of poverty. That's the idea here. And people who are buying the kidneys are also treating the, the others as a, as a mere means, unless it's a consensual relationship of, of an of a, uh, acceptable type. And people who are not preventing such uh, trade taking place are also blameworthy according to Kant's idea. So let me give another idea that Kant himself gives because maybe the idea, the, the example that I'm giving might be debatable because it's not an example that Kant, Kant himself gives. This kidney example is not an example that Kant himself gives. I just try to apply Kantian idea to a contemporary issue, but maybe it's not a great example. So let's go back to Kant's own examples to understand how it's, it might be wrong to treat oneself as a, as a mere means. Kant's famous example, one of famous uh, examples is suicide. Kant thinks 
the person who commits suicide is not treating their life as the intrinsically valuable thing, thing that it is. So according to Kant, someone who commits suicide is willing to end their intolerable pain that they are suffering. So they are treating their body as a means to end the suffering that they are going through. They are just ending their, humani their human life ending their life which has intrinsic value value, so that they can get rid of the intolerable pain that they are suffering. Kant, Kant still thinks that there is more to living a human life than having pleasure and pain. Intolerable pain or suffering doesn't make suicide morally right. So, okay, this is, this is quite controversial here. Kant, Kant is against suicide, it's clear, but uh, the, the, the reasoning is controversial. It's not easy to grasp. So let's Let's try to understand what Kant is trying to get at here. So Kant thinks human life is intrinsically valuable. It's an end in itself in, in Kantian terminology. It's an end. It's not a means to further goals. And think of the utilitarian idea here. Let, let's compare the utilitarian idea. According to utilitarianism, as we have discussed before, the moral right action is to promote pleasure and reduce pain. Increase the num, num, uh, amount of pleasure that, that uh, uh, people are enjoying and reduce the amount of pain that people are suffering. That was the utilitarian idea. And Kant seems to criticize an idea like that here, saying that if you just focus on pleasure and pain, if you, if you wanna reduce pain, and, and if suicide is the reason that you're trying to reduce pain, you're trying to get rid of intolerable conditions that you are suffering, then you're treating your human life as a means, as a tool, to attain a further thing which you call pleasure and pain. But human life is not something that you can treat like that. Human life is not a tool that you can treat as, as a means, as a, as a step to get further, according to Kant. So you should treat human life as the intrinsically valuable thing that it is, and pleasure or pain is not a reason to end human life. Or, or suffering, immense suffering is not a reason to end human life. And that's why Kant is against suicide. Again, I have to admit that this is a controversial view, but uh, there's, there's also some merit to it because it, it, it emphasizes the intrinsic value that human life has. Let's go, to, go back to Kant's other examples as well. So remember this, this chart about Kant's examples. On the, on the left-hand side uh, uh, column, we have perfect duties and imperfect duties. On the top row, we have duties to yourself and duties to others. And some of the duties that Kant gives are do not commit suicide, do not neglect your talents, do not give a false promise, and do not refuse to aid others. Let's go over some of these examples. And also you, you should remember that perfect and imperfect duties refer respectively to things that you should, all, you should always follow and things that you can sometimes ignore. These are, these are the distinctions that Kant was using to, to explain his uh, examples. So now let's try to understand Kant's examples using the second uh, formulation of the categorical imperative. And the second formulation is, so I, in, in my presentation, I first gave the formula of the ends. So that might see, seem like the second formulation, first formulation being the universal for law formulation. But in Kant's presentation, the second formulation, whenever we say the second formulation, we are referring to the uh, humanity formula, never treat humanity, never use humanity in your own person or, or in the person of another uh, as a mere means, but always as an end at the same time. That's the human formulation. So let's look at the false promise example, the lying promise example. When I give a lying promise to someone, I'm trying to pursue my own goals in a way that the other person could not possibly agree to, right? I mean, if, if the other person would, would agree to my ends, then why would I lie? It's clear that I'm, I'm lying, I'm giving a lying promise, and the example, the famous example that we gave last time and Kant also gives was uh, promising to pay your debt back even when you know that you are not going to pay it back and asking for, for to borrow some money from your friend under those circumstances. You, you, are, you, ask, for, you, you ask your friend to give you, give you some money, to lend you some money. You know that you're not going to pay back, but you promise that you are going to pay back. So you're giving a lying promise to your friend. These are the, this was the example that Kant was giving. So my own goal, what is, is, is uh, putting my hands on some money, right? Putting my hands on some cash. And I'm not telling my friend that I'm not going to pay it back. So my person, my friend cannot possibly agree to this, these conditions. And that's why I'm hiding these conditions actually. 
So in that sense, I'm using my friend as a mere means to my own ends. I'm treating my friend as if it was just a tool, as if it was just a vending machine in the previous example, right? I'm not treat treating my friend as the respectable human being that he is or she is. So giving a lying promise is against the second formulation of categorical imperative as well. Here I'm saying as well, because in the previous class we talked uh, about how categorical imperative forbids lying promise using the first formulation, which was the universal law formulation. In that, in that formulation, we tried to see how universali universalization of lying promise uh, creates a contradiction in, in, in terms, creates a conceptual contradiction that was in, in our previous class. If, if you want to remember it, you can just go back to our previous video and, and rem remind yourself how that formulation was forbidding lying promise. But now we are seeing that Lying promise, Kant's own example, is also forbidden by the second formulation of categorical imperative, the humanity formulation. And Kant's other, another example is neglecting your talents. Someone who doesn't develop their talents does not take human life as seriously as they are supposed to take. So they might indulge in the immediate self-interest, which doesn't necessarily promote human life as a value. And Kant thinks that this is wrong. In, in the previous class, we said that this is wrong according to Kant's categorical imperative, because uh, although this maxim uh, seems to be universalizable, you cannot want that everybody abides by this maxim, because some, some other people might want to uh, improve their talents. Some, 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 want, some other people might want, want to uh, take their talents seriously that in, in, uh, against the way that you are ignoring them. So that's why you cannot deal that, you cannot want that they, these, uh, this maxim become a universal law of nature. That was the way Kant was arguing against neglecting your talents. And, and, I, and I was saying in the previous video that this is not a very clear way of arguing against it. Kant was, I think, in my own personal humble opinion, was making the issue more complicated. But with the second formulation here now, on the right hand side of this slide, it, it just becomes, I think, a little bit more clear. So look at the third sentence on the th third paragraph on the right hand side of the slide. Treating yourself always also as an end requires you to promote this value, promote the value of improving your talents, because it's an important aspect of, you, of human life, your talents, improving your talents or uh, benefiting your talents and making other people benefit for you, from your talents is an important aspect of human life. So you should take it as, as seriously as as seriously as you can, so you should always also uh, you, you should always treat it also as an end, and treating some something also as an end, besides not tr not treating as a as a mere means requires it, it requires you to promote this value to um, increase the the benefits that you people and you yourself can uh, get from uh, developing this this value. Neglecting your, your talents is wrong because you're not promoting human life as a value. That's, that's the interpretation of the uh, second formulation of categorical imperative when you apply to Kant's example of neglecting your talents. So that's why Kant thinks neglecting your talents is wrong because you're, you, although you're not treating yourself as a mere means when you neglect your talents, right? You're not treating yourself as, as a mere tool when you neglect your talents. You're not doing anything negatively uh, wrong, but you're, you're failing to do something positive to yourself. You're failing to promote, improve your talents. You're, you're failing to promote the value of uh, human life in that sense. So that's why Kant thinks neglecting your talents is wrong. It's not as, I, mean, I have to admit that it's not as easy as other examples to see why it's wrong, but I mean, if, if, you, if, you, if you attune yourself with Kant's ideas, you might see the merit in such an idea. A further example that Kant gives is refusing aid to others. And Kant thinks refusing aid to others is also wrong. In the previous video, in the previous class, I also told that this was wrong according to the first formulation of categorical imperative because you cannot, again, like in the talents example, you cannot deal that, you cannot want that other people refuse aid to others. That's why you cannot you deal, you deal the universalization of this maxim. That's why it was wrong. And I, and as I admitted that it's not a clear idea. And now let's see if this idea becomes more clear with the, now, with the second formulation of categorical imperative. Ignoring someone who needs aid is not necessarily treating them as a mere means, especially when we have no direct or indirect contact. So as, as in the uh, neglecting talents example, it's not directly clear 
why they're choosing aid to others is wrong because we're not treating anybody as a mere means when we are not aid giving aid to them when we're not helping them right i mean someone might be in, in dire straits in, in 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 extreme difficulty or let's say someone's suffering extreme poverty but I, I can always say, okay, did I put that person in ex extreme poverty? I'm not guilty for, I'm not blameworthy for putting that person in extreme poverty. Why should I be using that person as a mere means, especially when I have no direct or indirect contact with them? That person is just someone, that, that person might be just living, uh, that, must, that person might just be someone living in, in a far, far, far away city from me or, or a far away neighborhood from me. I might not even see that person or hear about that person, right? So how am I treating that person as a mere means? Kant says, maybe you're not treating that person as a mere means, but you're not treating them as an ends uh, uh, either. That's why this, this behavior is against the second formulation of categorical imperative. And I here on the left-hand side of the uh, slide, I just put in parentheses this sentence, which is also important, unlike the sweatshop example, where there is indirect contact with the workers through the products we use. So in, in the sweatshop example, the workers were working under difficult conditions to produce the clothes that we are buying. The, the garments, the shoes, the toys, especially, they are produced in sweatshops all around the world. So you're using those products, uh, but if so, that that creates an indirect contact with these people, and that's why when we ignore their working conditions or the or the hardships that they're they are suffering, that becomes problematic for 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 the for the Kantian. And the example here we are using, the refusing aid to others is, a, is slightly different. There has to be no direct or indirect contact. So it excludes the sweatshop case in that sense. But by ignoring others, we are not treating them as ends either. We ought to consider how they are pursuing their own ends as well. That's what Kantian category imperative requires us to do. We have to consider how people are pursuing their own ends as the intrinsically valuable thing that they are. Refusing to aid others is wrong because we are not promoting, we are not developing, we are not improving the ways these people could get control of their lives. So according to Kant's idea, the second formulation of categorical imperative, the humanity formulation, it's not enough not to hurt others, not to harm others. It's not enough uh, to, do, to, to be morally uh, praiseworthy or to, to do the morally right thing. It's not sufficient. You also have to help others because uh, that's how you treat them as ends in themselves, as, a, as the intrinsically valuable thing that they are. It's not only not harming others, but you also have to help others who are in need so that you can claim to have done the morally right thing. And this actually captures some intuitively very strong idea in our moral lives. I, I think Kant captures this idea with this, with this example. So now let's look at Kantian methodology. Kant offers a developed method for finding out whether an action is morally right or not. And these are the questions we have to answer to find this out. First one, what action do you propose? So each time you, you, you're doing an action, this is one of the questions to ask to evaluate your action from a moral point of view. Which action do you propose? Second question, what's the maximum of your action? Which principle are you following when you're doing that action? And the third question has three, three parts. First part, can you will that the maximum of your action should become a universal law? And this refers to the first formulation of categorical imperative, the universal law formulation. The second aspect, are you pro proposing to treat yourself or another person merely as a means and not as an end in himself or herself? The second formulation of categorical imperative. And the third aspect, are you acting in accordance with the maxims of a member giving universal laws for a kingdom of ends? And we refer to this formulation at the beginning of our presentation. So you have to answer these questions to find out whether an act is morally right or wrong. And, and it's not an easy task, right? I mean, first of all, when we are doing an action, we do not ask the first question, what action do you propose? I mean, let's assume that I'm going to, um, let's assume that I'm going to walk on the street and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm passing by a beggar. And there's this beggar who is begging, begging for some money I do not propose any action most of the time. I'm just, I'm just trying to get to somewhere. Maybe I'm going to the supermarket. I'm just passing by someone else, right? I'm not proposing any action. What do you mean by proposing action? But let's try to understand what Kant means by it, right? And uh, you, you might not be proposing an action at that moment, but if you're making a moral evaluation of your act, 
then you have to find out maybe you can you can just go back in in thinking and then say that okay what was i thinking when i just passed by that beggar who needed help that i didn't help what was i thinking what was what kind of an action was i doing i was maybe just self-indulged self uh, self uh, uh, co contained in my own world and just focusing on going to the supermarket and not not even paying attention to people who need help around me maybe that was the action that i was proposing so you can you can also answer this question later on you're not thinking of your actions each time before you're doing the action, right? So Kant might have a point here. But another difficulty is finding the appropriate maxim, maxim for an action. And here is an example. You want to be an engineer, but you're not sure whether this is morally permissible. And you want to find, use the Kantian method to find out whether it's, it's morally permissible for you to become an engineer. What should, what should your maxim be uh, to put it into Kantian test? And which maxim are you suggest are you proposing to be put under the test when you become an engineer? Right? That that's the second. Let me go back one slide. So the second question is what's what's the maximum of your action? The first question was what action do you propose? Okay, the action is I will just pick the engineering departments in, in universities. That's the first action. The second question asks, what's the maximum of your action? What's the principle of your action? Which principle are you following when you become a when you are trying to become an engineer. And this is, this is as I will show you right now, is not, a, is not a, a question that you can answer very, very easily. So your maxim, for, first of all, can be something like this, the first candidate of being your maxim. Become an engineer if you want to become one, right? This, maybe this is, the, this, is the, this is the maximum that you're following. I wanna be an engineer, so I'll become an engineer. So what? That might be the maximum that you're using. This is clearly universalizable, that was the, Kantian test, right? You, want, you have to universalize. You have to want that, your, you have to will that your principle, your maxim should become a universal law of nature. And there's nothing contradictory for this maxim to, to become a universal law of nature. If, if anybody who wants to become an engineer becomes an engineer, there's, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing conceptually wrong about this maxim. But it doesn't have the categorical form that it has to have for, for Kant to have a moral worth. Remember the two, two criteria that Kant proposes in his first formulation of categorical imperative. A maxim, first of all, you find the maxim, and, and the first criteria is the maxim has to be universalizable. If, 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 it, if it passes this test, then you put it into a second test that uh, checks whether the maxim is, has the categorical form. And in order to have a categorical form, it shouldn't have implicit or explicit if clauses. And this sentence, this maxim, clearly is an explicit if clause. It says, if you wanna become an engineer, you, you can become one. But um, this is not the categorical form that Kant wants. He wants an imperative form. He wants a form that commands you to do something. Hence, it doesn't have the moral worth. And it's important to note, look at the, the sentence that I put in parentheses here. When I say this sentence doesn't have moral worth for Kant, it doesn't mean that it's morally wrong, okay? Not having moral worth means that this is just a prudential behavior. This is a prudential in the, in the sense that it's a behavior that will benefit you in the future. That's what it means. It's, it's not necessarily morally wrong. This maxim is permissible. It might be permissible. It's just not morally permissible. It might be prudentially permissible, right? That's the idea. But how do I know that this is my maxim? Maybe my maxim is this, when I wanna be an engineer, just become an engineer. Because in the first maxim, the criti criticism was that it doesn't have the categorical form. It doesn't have the form of a command. Now I change it to, to have the for a form of a command. Now become an engineer is the command, is the categorical form that Kant wants us to use. So maybe my, my maxim has this formula, uh, has this form, sorry, and this is the maxim that I'm following. But this is not even universalizable. You cannot build that everyone accepts this maxim as a moral law that would leave the society without individuals occupied with other professions. So becoming an engineer, become an engineer cannot be a moral law that they, you want everybody to follow. That's why this maxim uh, is, is not permissible. How about a third maxim? Something like this, pick your ideal job. So this, this co uh, conforms the uh, law form, categorical form, it seems like a law. It, it, it has the command, commanding structure, like pick your ideal job. And it can be universalized, right? So uh, since it can be universalized and it has the pro proper categorical form, so universalizing this maxim doesn't create any conceptual contradictions, then this maxim is permissible and it has moral worth. So if you're 
if you are uh, aiming to be an engineer, planning to become an engineer, with this maxim in, in, your, in your mind, then your act is morally permissible, it has a moral law. But the important question is, which maximum am I, am I following when I decide to become an engineer, right? It's not easy to find. So Kant doesn't give us a, a practical guide to find out which maximum I'm following. It's a difficult thing to find out which maximum I'm following. And I mean, as we have seen here, some maxims are universalizable, but they don't have more worth. Some others are not even universalizable, so they are, they are morally wrong, actually, to follow those maxims. And some others, some other maxims are, are morally right and they have moral worth. So, but which maxim am I following? It's not clear. So this is, this creates a difficulty for Kantian deontology. Let's go back to Kant's lying example. Actually, this example is different than lying promise because Kant's lying promise example is rather clear. This example is different. This is just on lying, like telling a lie. Kant, what, Kant, what does Kant say about telling a lie? And Kant has a famous and rather actually infamous example. A murderer comes to your door asking whether the person he wishes to kill is inside. You are hiding the person inside and now you're, you're considering is lying to the murderer morally right act. Can you just say the mur murderer, no, he's not here. And if you say it convincingly enough, maybe the murderer will, will just leave. Oh, okay, he's not here, then I'm, I'm leaving. Maybe that will be the case, right? But Kant, is, Kant wants, you to, wants you to think whether this is morally the right act. To, to conduct. So first you have to find out what might be your maxim if you will to lie to, to the murderer at the door. Maybe this is, this is the maxim. Lie whenever you need to. And you, with this maxim in your head, you're okay, I have this maxim, this principle that I'm following. Li I can lie whenever I need to. Then I can tell a lie to the murderer at the door. But this, is, this surely isn't universalizable. You lie whenever you need to is against uh, Kantian categorical imperative and it's against universalizable, uh, universalizability criteria that we discussed last, in the last class. So it's, it's, it's morally wrong. You cannot use this maxim. It will be morally wrong. How about this maxim? Tell a lie if your lie would save a life and the person to whom you lie doesn't have a moral right to learn the truth. So this is, this is it's, it's not very clear if this maxim is universalizable. It might or might not face the contradiction problem because I mean, it, it gives a lot of details right? I mean, you, you, your lie would save a life and the person you're lying to, the murderer at the door, doesn't have a moral right to learn the truth. So maybe you might have a lie, but you might have a right to lie, but it, it's not clear if, if, if you can universalize uh, this, this principle. But let's see if, if this formula, if this maxim fits the second formulation of categorical imperative. And Kant thinks it doesn't because he argues that you treat humanity as a mere means when you lie even to the murderer at your door. So if, when you are lying to the murderer, you might be saving a life. It might be prudential, it might be a self-interested or, or even other regarding behavior in that sense. But you are even to the murderer when you lie, you're treating humanity as a mere means. You're, you're, you cannot say that you, are, you have done the right thing. Of course, you can lie to the murderer to save a life. You might have saved one life, which is a good thing but you can never say that you have done the morally right thing according to Kant. And this is again, again a, bit, a little bit controversial here, but Kant might be onto something. He's, he's trying to say that, okay, you might do some actions which bring good results in this world, but bringing good results is not the same with doing morally the right thing. And here Kant is saying something controversial, but at the same time, something very interesting from a philosophical point of view. Good is distinct from doing the moral right thing according to Kant. This is a very clear example. When you save a life, you do something good. Very clearly you do something good. Human, saving a human life is a good thing. And assuming that, that that person that you save is not a horrible person. Okay. But you're not doing something right according to Kant because you're lying, right? And also Kant further says, so this is at the right hand side of the slide at the bottom. Also, you should not try to make calculations about consequences. What if the person decides to escape, the person that you are hiding decides to escape from the window and get caught outside by the murderer? So this time you lied to the murderer. The murderer said, okay, if he's not in, I'm just leaving. And the person at the same time was thinking that the murderer is getting in. They just escaped from the window and they just meet outside and the murderer kills the person. So you, you in a sense, uh, might have caused 
this this incident. So I mean, Kant says you, you cannot uh, make calculations about your your act. You shouldn't try to make calculations. You should just follow firm principles to find out what actions are morally right actions. And compare this verdict of Kant to that of a utilitarian. It's, it's very interesting to, to make this comparison. According to the theorem, the morally right action is uh, to, to increase pleasure and decrease pain, right? This is what we have said in, our, in, the, in the class on utilitarianism and, and in the applied issue, we just went over it as well. You are supposed to do the, the right action in, in, uh, to do is to increase the amount of pleasure and decrease the amount of suffering or, or pain for, for that matter. And when you when a, when a murderer comes to your door, you you just ask yourself, okay, how do I increase pleasure and decrease pleasure, uh, pain with, with my act? What should I do? Should I lie to the murderer and say that okay, no, the person is not here. There's nobody here. You, can you just leave? And I mean, the person is not here, so you are lying to the murderer. With this act, if you're convincing enough, the murderer might just leave. Maybe the murderer doesn't love you, and you're convincing enough, the murderer might just leave. And you're increasing, uh, you're first of all, you're definitely decreasing pain. The, the pain of the person who was going to be killed or the people who are going to be sad, who are going to be suffering after the person is killed are relieved of a certain pain. So for a utilitarian, it seems like the right action is to make, to tell a lie to the, to the murderer at the door. What does Kant say? So Kant's last point was you don't try to make calculations. If you try to make calculations, maybe the person escapes from the window and just gets caught outside. I think this is not a good good argument. I mean, okay, we, we always try to uh, uh, make some calculations before before acting. That's that's how we live, right? We have to make calculations, otherwise we cannot determine our our actions. So, and and you might be living on the eighth floor or the or the tenth floor of a, of a building, and the, and the uh, uh, murder comes to your door at the eighth floor of an of a uh, apartment complex, right? And then, I mean, the person, there's no way the person can escape from the window. So, I mean, cal it's, it's, I mean, sometimes some, some calculations might lead you to the right direction, but Kant thinks, so that, that point, I think Kant doesn't, is not very strong about the not calculating cal uh, uh, consequences of our actions. It's not, it, Kant might be right about not trying to calculate consequences, but his, his example, his particular example is a bad example, I think. That's, that's my idea. That's my uh, idea about this example. But Kant might still be right about not trying to make calculations because human beings are, have, have done multiple mistakes. We know that when, when we are trying to calculate the, the results of our actions. So maybe Kant has a point to say, tell us that, okay, just follow some firm principles that your rationality commands you to follow. And not don't try to make calculations for yourself. Maybe maybe that 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 might be a good point for Kant. And a, and a utilitarian, on the other hand, has has to make calculations, right? A, a utilitarian when when a murderer is at my door, and if I'm uh, taking utilitarian ethics to be the right way of thinking about morality, I have to make calculations. Okay, if I tell a lie now, probably this mur I, I'm I'll be convincing enough, and this murderer will just leave. So I'll be saving a life, and that's the right thing to do. So maybe I, I should do that. So I think here, it's uh, utilitarian might be on a, on a point as well. I mean, sometimes doing the good thing also coincides with doing the right thing. So here, here is a clear conflict with Kantian and utilitarian theories. And which one is the right thing might uh, depend on your, your convictions of morality. And it's not an easy, it doesn't have an easy answer. Both have their own strengths and weaknesses. And in this example, I think in this particular example, I think utilitarian is, is on, on, on a better standing than Kantian uh, deontology, although Kant might have a, a point that has a larger, uh, larger spectrum of hitting the right, right answer. So Kant says, let me just repeat it, Kant says just stick to firm principles, don't try to make calculations based on actions. Stick to firm principles. Utilitarian says make, try to make calculations or, or try to follow the calculations that people that you're trusting are making. Okay, this is a, this is a clear divergence between these two theories. So what's the summary of whole, this whole lecture? This whole uh, lecture on, on challenges against Kantian deontology. Kantian deontology has its particular difficulties in application. First one is it's not always clear 
whether a maxim can pass the categorical imperative test. And you have seen the difficulties that we have, we have faced. Difficulties of determining the true maxim of my action also persists. You remember the, the engineering example, should I become an engineer? Which maxim am I following it? Then when I ask that question to myself, that's a, that's a difficult for Kantian deontology. Also the conclusions Kant draws on lying is under suspicion as you have seen in the, in the murder at the door example. Nevertheless, Kantian deontology continues to be one of the major trends in moral philosophy, also because of the strengths that I've just mentioned uh, in, in, this, in this presentation. So I think this is, this is all for, for today's class. Thank you for listening to me. These were the, some of the challenges that Kantian philosophy faces. Thank you for listening.